Today's episode is sponsored by Visible Alpha. Visible Alpha built a platform in partnership with 160 brokers to analyze consensus data and financial metrics on over 6,000 publicly traded companies globally. Visible Alpha extracts data from every line item across sell-side models so you can better understand expectations on metrics beyond just revenue and earnings without having to dig through models one by one. Try Visible Alpha for free by visiting visiblealpha.com slash TED. I'm Ted Seides, and this is Manager Meetings. This show is an exploration of investment opportunities. Through conversations with money managers conducted by one of the manager's institutional clients, we'll share the stories and strategies that attracted their attention and capital. You can learn more and join our mailing list at CapitalAllocators.com. All opinions expressed by Ted, guest hosts, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of capital allocators or their respective firms. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of capital allocators, the firms of guest hosts, or podcast guests may maintain positions in securities or managers discussed on this podcast. On today's manager meeting, David Wong interviews Howard Smith. David is an associate director at Utimco, the $66 billion investment company that manages the largest public endowment fund in the country. Howard is a partner and portfolio manager of the Japan Strategies at Indus Capital, an Asia-focused investment firm that manages $3.5 billion, including a billion focused on Japan. Indus was founded in 2000 by its non-executive chairs, Sheldon Kazowitz and David Kowitz, upon spinning out of Soros Fund Management. David and Howard's conversation covers Howard's upbringing in the rural United Kingdom, experience in Japan, and investment philosophy. They discuss Indus's investment approach, global team structure, corporate governance in Japan, and opportunities on the horizon. Please enjoy this manager meeting with Howard Smith of Indus Capital. Howard, a pleasure spending some time with you this afternoon. would love to hear about your origin story. Thank you, David. It's always a pleasure to speak to you. I wouldn't even describe the place I grew up in as a town, actually. It was very much a village. It, I think it had barely 2,000 people. It was a very rural part of England in the south of England, surrounded by fields of wheat and barley. That was the local economy, arable farming. I guess you could say I had a pretty conventional upbringing, a very you know, middle-class family. I went to local state school and then a, a state secondary school. My formative years were, I think, very typical for that part of the world. I think I probably went to London once in my first 10 years of my life. Uh, And that was about the extent of my travel within the UK. What I did get, though, from my early years, I think, was a love of foreign travel. We were fortunate enough to be able to travel to places like France and Spain on summer trips during school holidays. So I was very immersed in foreign cultures from a young age, and I think I picked that up from my parents. And when I was about 13, my dad went overseas to work in the Middle East for three years. So it was my mother and my sister and myself living at home. So she was kind of a single mum for about three years, and we, we didn't see my father much. So that, I think, also inspired in me a desire one day to work overseas and to stretch my wings a bit and look outside in the big wide world, outside the little village where I grew up. I guess I had that sort of wanderlust from an early age, and I would credit my parents with their summer trips and my dad's job in the Middle East for kind of really triggering that interest. And most of your friends and family from childhood, did they stick around the village or did they spread their wings like you did? Most stuck around the village. You know, in fact, I'm still in touch with some of them. They still live in the same village. They work two or three miles away. They bought homes in that village. They started families in that village. It was still relatively rare when I was growing up in that part of the world for people to go to university. So a lot of people left school at the age of 16. I was in a small minority of kids from my school who went on to go to university. I'm actually the first person in my family who attended university. 
So that was a novel thing. I moved up to the north of England to a city called York to attend university. That was very unusual in my family and certainly in my peer group. And that was obviously a huge eye-opener for me to do that because suddenly I was mixing with people from all over the UK and from overseas. There were a lot of overseas students there too from Europe, some from Japan. And so I got to know some Japanese people at the university and I think that stimulated a little bit of interest in Japan. I, I can't confess to having a love of Japanese anime or a love of Japanese video games from a young age. That would be disingenuous. But I think... I think as I went to university, and I started in 1985 at university, it coincided with the rise of Japan and, and the sort of hyper growth period in Japan in the second half of the 1980s after the Plaza Accord, and of course the big asset bubble that was forming at the time. So that was a happy coincidence, I think, that Japan's great rise and the kind of existential angst that countries like the US were experiencing over the rise of Japan coincided with my my university years. So that was just an element of timing, I guess, in my life that helped to trigger an interest in the country. What did you end up doing after graduation? So I was going to work in London. I had a job all fixed up in London. I was going to be a property analyst, analyzing rents and yields on commercial property in the UK. But my interest in Japan had been building during this period. So Much to the shock and horror of my parents, I announced that I wasn't going to take up this job in London and that I was going to get on a plane to go to Tokyo. I didn't have a job to go to in Tokyo, so I imagined this would be kind of a one-year endeavor to learn a little bit of language and maybe make a little bit of money and then hopefully come back to this job. And I told them that this is what I was going to do, and they very kindly held the offer open for me and said it was an open offer and I could take it up again. So I got on an Aeroflot aircraft in October 1988. I turned up in Tokyo for the first time. That's where my real relationship with Japan started. It was a wild and crazy place in 1988. It was the peak of the asset bubble. I was completely out of my depth. I didn't speak a word of the language. And in those days, Tokyo wasn't a particularly international city. There were very few signs in English. I didn't know what I was doing. I couldn't go from A to B on the train system very effectively. It was a struggle to find somewhere to live. But I soon realized that if I was going to make something of myself in this country, I absolutely had to get proficient in the language. You couldn't go into a restaurant and say, do you speak English? That didn't work. In, it used to work in France and Spain, but it didn't work in Tokyo in those days. So I spent about a year and a half, actually, at a language school studying four hours a day. And that was very, very enriching for me because it opened up so many avenues and suddenly I could communicate with people and ask questions of people. And that was probably the best decision I made because I think it's completely changed my relationship with the country and it's absolutely made me more proficient at the job I do now. But I ended up working at Nomura in Japan. My background was economics and finance at university. That was the area I'd always wanted to go in. And I was working with a guy called Richard Koo at Nomura, who's still there. And he was a macro guy. And he was sort of a bridge between Japan and the US on areas like monetary policy. He was very well connected at the Federal Reserve and also at the Bank of Japan. So I did some ghostwriting for him. I did some editing work for him. And my goal then was to be a macro guy. I wanted to develop a career as a strategist or a macroeconomist. I hadn't yet developed an interest in single stock analysis or corporate finance. I was set on having some career to do with Japan in a macro field. And I ended up getting married in Japan. I met my wife in Tokyo. We've been married now for almost 30 years. And we moved back to the UK in the mid 90s. And I got a job in London with the Economist Intelligence Unit, which is the publishing arm of the Economist newspaper, writing quarterly reports on macroeconomics. And I covered a number of countries, including Japan, but I also wrote about South Korea and North Korea and Taiwan. And that was a wonderful job for me. But I always had a desire to go back to Japan again and develop something more of myself in Japan. I'd had a relatively junior role in Tokyo between 1988 and 1992. And having got proficient in the language, I always felt that I could do more. And we ended up returning to Tokyo in 1997. And this time it was the start of my love affair with corporate finance and single stock analysis. And I got a job as a, as a stock analyst at what was then called ING Bearing Securities 
Berings had famously gone bust in 1995 after Nick Leeson brought the bank down, (laughs) punting in Nikkei Futures. So ING, which is a a Dutch insurance company, had taken over Berings Bank and was called ING Berings. And I got to work with a really inspirational guy called Mike Allen, who was the retail analyst at Berings at the time. And I took on some of the smaller cap retail stocks working under him. And that really lit up in me a passion for for corporate finance and for analyzing P&L and balance sheet and cash flow. And Mike was and still is to this day an extremely passionate writer and a great storyteller. And his written work was exceptionally interesting to read. So this to me was a tremendously fascinating nexus of being able to apply some technical knowledge about accounting and modeling and forecasting with writing and projecting a message. And I found this really, really interesting. But through my job as a junior retail analyst, I got to know Byron Gill, who was in Tokyo at the time as a retail analyst. And Byron is now the managing partner of Indus Capital and one of the founding partners of the firm in the year 2000. So that's how my path crossed with Byron. That dates back to the late 1990s when we were bumping into each other at convenience store merchandise fairs and comparing dried shrimp crackers and, <laughs> and yogurt drinks and stuff like that. I was in Japan between 97 and 2018. So that was a 21 year period. And if you add on the four year period between 1988 and 1992, I lived in Tokyo for 25 years in total, which is the majority of my adult life. And most of that time has been spent with Indus. I joined Indus in 2002 from ING Bearings. And I've spent the last 20 years. This year is my 20th anniversary at Indus. So you first got to Tokyo after graduating. It was sounds like it was right around the boom and bust of the early 90s bubble. Did that experience being there on the ground for that and seeing that have an impact on your investing philosophy at all? I think it was absolutely formative. So I experienced the end of the bubble, the peak of the bubble, and then the beginning of the bursting of the bubble. The market peaked in December 1989, and the Bank of Japan was raising rates through 1990. So being at Nomura at the time, I had a front row seat on the bubble peaking and then the bubble bursting. And of course, that was the beginning of a great balance sheet recession in Japan the ramifications of which persist to this day. You know, we're still, we're still talking about this 30 years later. I think we've at last worked through that now, and corporate Japan is in a much, much healthier state than it was 30 years ago. But yes, the idea that companies could drown under a weight of debt and that balance sheets could have large write-downs and that stated assets aren't always what you think they are I think has had a profound impact on the way that I think about companies, or at least the importance of looking at capital structure and balance sheet and cash flow in addition to standard P&L analysis and what's happening to revenues and operating profit and EPS. The trifecta, if you like, of all three of the financial statements, I think was seared into me at a very young age. And I think also... The notion that value investing is relevant and works was seared into me at a young age too. The period from 1992, after the initial bursting of the bubble, really up until I think the global financial crisis and beyond, until we got into a global era of zero rates around 2015 or 2016, value investing was the predominant form of investing and certainly the model that resonated the best in the Japanese market. So I've always been extremely conscious of multiples. I would call myself, if you had to put a label on me, I'm probably a GARP investor, a growth at a reasonable price investor. But I think my understanding of what constitutes reasonable price has been very much formed by my experience in Japan from 1988 onwards. So you joined Indus in 2002. Talk about your path growing up through the firm and now managing the Japan strategies. In those days, Indus had two funds. It was a hedge fund. We had two long, short strategies. We didn't have a long-only business in those days. We had a Japan fund that was managed by Sheldon Kasowitz, and we had an Asia X Japan fund that was managed by David Coetz. 
Both of them were long short strategies. And both Sheldon and David had been senior figures at Soros, working on the quantum funds, and had spun out of Soros in 2000 when Stanley Druckenmiller moved on to do things for himself. So a group of investment professionals led by Sheldon and David and taking along characters like Byron Gill and Jim Shannon, who's now our CEO, and Ben DeSoma, who's now our head of research, those guys spun out of Soros to form Indus in the year 2000. Byron was the lead analyst on the Japan Long Short Fund, and I joined as the second analyst on the Japan Long Short Fund. We had a very small office in Tokyo, and there were three of us in that office. There was Byron, myself, and an office manager. That was it. That was the setup in Japan. Sheldon sat in New York, and he ran the funds from New York. And that's what I did for many years. And in this, I was working in Tokyo as an analyst, forming investment ideas and writing reports internally. As time went on, Byron graduated to being a fund manager in his own right. I stepped up to the lead analyst role under Sheldon and took a much more senior role. And as you know, we launched a long only business in 2010, thanks to Utimco. And that was the second of the two Japan funds. So we had a Japan long short fund and a Japan long only fund. And if you fast forward to today, the long only business has become much bigger than the long short business. But as Sheldon started to dial back and step aside from fund management, I started to play a greater role in the stock selection and the management of the analytical team. So I became head of research for Japan and I was managing a group of analysts within the firm covering Japanese stocks and increasingly playing a role alongside Sheldon as a co-portfolio manager. And then when Sheldon stepped away and retired from the firm, I took over from him as the fund manager for both of those products, managing a team of people in North America and in Tokyo. And as part of that process, I decided to take the big decision to leave Tokyo in 2018 and move to San Francisco. Talk about that decision to move from Tokyo to San Francisco. As you can tell from my accent, I'm not American. And so I'd never lived in the States before. I had no family links here, had no particular personal reason to be here. But when I started at Indus in 2002, The competition was the big U.S. mutual fund industry. It was Fidelity and Capital and Putnam and T. Rowe. And the toolkit that people were using was broadly similar to the toolkit that we use. It was fundamental investing based on company visits, based on getting to know the management of companies well. If you look at the world of investing in Tokyo today, you know, it's dominated by the platform hedge funds and... I think the whole approach has changed. These are market neutral hedge funds and quite often beta neutral and factor neutral and running money with high turnover, highly leveraged strategies that have much different investment horizons from the ones that I want to think of. So the whole language of investing had changed. And when I was speaking to brokers, they would be telling me about what to expect with an earnings beat or an earnings miss next week in this company, or even sometimes how the value factor in the AM session was outperforming the growth factor, but how that was reversing in the PM session. And this was kind of alien to me. I didn't want to know about this stuff. It doesn't resonate with me in terms of how I want to think of investing. I want to dive deep with companies. I want to get to know the management of companies very well. I want to form long-term relationships with the management of companies. I want to get inside behind the curtain and understand how companies work, how decisions are made. I want to understand their end markets. I want to understand their competition. I want to understand their technology, their R&D. And short-term market neutral investing isn't about that. It's about mean reversion. It's about taking money off the table quickly and putting it back to work quickly. And that's not how I think about investing at all. I really wanted to see Japan from a different perspective and get closer to the other portfolio managers at Indus, all of whom were based in North America, either in New York or in San Francisco. So here I am now in San Francisco working alongside Byron and John Pinkle, who manages our Pan-Asian long-only product called the Indus Select Fund. Also working with Ben DeSoma, who's our head of research. So I can interact with those guys much more 
understand how they're thinking about the world, how Japan fits into the matrix of countries in which they invest. They invest in China, they invest in the ASEAN region, they invest in Australia. We're obviously all based here in America, so the ability to access information about US politics or geopolitics or the Federal Reserve is much easier here than it was in Tokyo. Being out of a live market also, I think, is very beneficial to me. The market here opens at 5 p.m., so I have all day to think and strategize and speak to analysts and read reports and and really not get bound up in the babble of the day-to-day tick-watching of markets that can afflict you, I think, if you're in a live market. So it was a big personal upheaval, to be honest, especially for my wife and kids. So it wasn't an easy decision to make, but from a professional point of view, I think it was absolutely the right decision. And I think I've clearly benefited from this new perspective Pre-COVID, I was actually getting better access to the senior management of Japanese companies here than I ever did in Japan. You know, they come on these non-deal roadshows often to the United States, and you can get to meet the CEOs and CFOs of mega cap companies. And that's very hard to do in Japan because once they go back to Tokyo, they sort of disappear into the woodwork of managing their firms. And the accessibility or the access to top management is actually better I found outside Japan than inside Japan. So that's been different, obviously, with the pandemic. So that was really the inspiration behind it. At first glance, some might find it peculiar that all the PMs are based outside of Asia, yet all the investing happens in Asia. Curious how Indus has made that model successful and why it works for you guys. Yeah, that's a great question. It's always been the model. It was the model with Soros when David and Sheldon were doing that job for Soros in the 90s. They were based in New York, Ben DeSoma and Byron and the others were the analysts based out in the region. And that's the model that Indus adopted from day one. So we've always had boots on the ground in the region. If you look at Indus today, we have an office in Tokyo, we have an office in Hong Kong, we have an office in Shanghai. And then here in the States, we have offices in San Francisco and New York. So that has always been the model. The PMs have traditionally traveled to the region on a regular basis. And we will do that again once borders reopen and travel becomes easier. But I think we combine the best of both worlds. You know, we've got a global perspective here. We can see what's happening with the competition for a lot of Asian companies in which we invest. If you look at the Japan funds that I manage, the majority of the companies in which we invest are global businesses. They're domiciled in Japan, but they generate the majority of their revenue outside Japan. What's happening in the Japanese economy isn't directly relevant quite often to their futures or their revenue streams or their margins. So understanding their clients or their competitors who are domiciled in Europe or the States is an extremely important part of the business. And I think being based in America and having that perspective and accessibility to these companies is an important element of what we do. But we combine that with a permanent presence in the region, strong language skills. So we're linguistically equipped to deal with the companies out in the region. I think our PMs have very deep connections with the region. And the majority of us have spent most of our adult lives living in the region. We have boots on the ground based there permanently out on the road visiting companies, developing relationships, doing analysis. But we have that global perspective of being able to understand the supply chains and the competitors of the companies in which we invest. And I think that's really, really important if you're going to have a holistic view of investment management. And I think it's a model that's always worked for us and it's a proven concept and I think we'll continue to work in the years ahead. Talk a little bit about how collaboration happens internally at the firm, what methods you guys use, and how you guys schedule everything and coordinate with so many different people in so many different places. So I think it's a very coherent system that really relies heavily on the written work that we produce. We archive our work on multiple internal systems, actually. I think our incentive structure is designed in a way that heavily incentivizes people to collaborate across products. So our teams are loosely arranged around individual funds, but almost every analyst reports across multiple funds and speaks to multiple fund managers. And that's nowhere is that more true than Japan, because we have myself and Byron and John all investing in the Japanese market. 
some long short, some long only. So in addition to the written work, we have regular team meetings and what we call pastor calls. Pastor is is our way of essentially preparing and evolving a thesis through a determined process and exposing it to scrutiny and debate. So we use the written word and a lot of internal face-to-face meetings to scrutinize and debate and challenge the underlying work of the analysts and the thesis that they're developing. But those analysts are heavily incentivized through our compensation structure to cross-fertilize or pollinate their ideas to PMs other than their direct reporting line. Expand on the pasta making process a bit. Yeah, so a pasta normally starts with a one or two page document that I would call 60 or 70% cooked, if you like. It's not a completely off the cuff, random idea. There's a lot of work that goes into an initial pasta report. And then the analyst will volunteer his or her time to present that report to a group of portfolio managers. We'll then go through an initial meeting where the portfolio managers and the other analysts are free to scrutinize and challenge the work that's being done on that company. We may decide at that point to shoot it down and and move on. We may put it on ice for a while and say it's potentially very interesting, but the timing isn't appropriate right now. We'll come back to it at a later time. But more typically, that work would lead to a list of follow-up projects or topics that need to be addressed. We'll collectively decide that we need to develop it in this way or, or another way. We're lacking a little bit of insight in this area or that area. And it will therefore evolve into a longer form note with a lot more information in terms of charts and tables and a fully blown earnings model That forms really the fully baked thesis, if you like. If it then meets the hurdle for inclusion in the portfolio, that itself is a complex topic that involves working with the risk team and ultimately is the portfolio manager's decision. The buck stops with the portfolio manager. But we'll then use that work as the basis for forming a position over time. And that body of work will then be subject to regular maintenance and regular updates and and sometimes additional scrutiny and additional follow-up work if that is necessary. But it will form the basis for a thesis that we can go back to that ideally has shelf life over a very long period of time. What I'm looking for as a portfolio manager, David, more than anything else is, is depth of insight. Ultimately, it's about change at the margin. We're looking for something that is different, something that the market has not discounted or has not understood. That can involve going down multiple vectors. That can involve understanding the management intentions of a company, the way the board interacts with the broader firm. It can involve understanding the supply chain, the competitive landscape. Typically, it will involve some description of the moat around a company, the barriers to entry, And that's often, in the case of Japan, R&D driven or technology driven, or it can be patent driven, some sort of intangible asset that's very hard to recreate. So we're looking for a great depth of knowledge and some insights that really differentiate our research from what we think is discounted in the market. And I think having a lot of experience on our bench and among our PMs gives us the ability to sense change on a continuum of time because more often than not we're investing in companies after having seen them over a number of years we're not normally investing in companies that we are seeing for the first time or that we don't know very well we're we're sniffing out change on a continuum and sensing how different that is relative to that company 10 years ago or 15 years ago that's really the crux of how i think as a portfolio manager. And while you specialize in Japan, you sit at a firm that invests pan regionally. Talk about an example where sitting next to investors that invest across Asia has helped you in Japan. There's a lot of examples, honestly. I mean, I think the most relevant is probably the technology sector. Japanese companies are absolutely critical players in the value chain for semiconductor production, whether it's the production equipment that's used in lithography or etching or inspection or cleaning or dicing or whatever it may be, or whether it's the materials that are used in areas like semiconductor resists, 
or slurries. Japan plays an absolutely critical role at leading edge nodes in the production of semiconductors globally. But the ultimate producers of those semiconductors are companies like TSMC or Samsung or Micron or Intel. They are not Japanese companies. So the Japanese companies are the B2B businesses that the end consumer doesn't see. When you buy a Samsung phone, you're completely unaware of the Japanese content behind that phone. But that phone isn't going to see the light of day without the input of a large number of Japanese companies. So I think the interplay of the branded producers of consumer electronics and the supply chain behind them, the vertical integration, is something that is absolutely critical to what we do. So as I think about investing in companies in Japan that make semiconductor production equipment, I need to know what's going on at TSMC and Samsung. I need to understand the technology roadmap of these companies. I need to understand the capex intentions of these companies. And there's a huge amount of work going on at Indus Capital on those very topics. So I think that's a really powerful differentiating factor for us as we invest in a market like Japan. But Japan is largely these days a B2B investment opportunity as opposed to a B2C. I mean, of course, there are B2C companies in Japan and there are very big brands. Japan has some amazing brands like Nintendo and Sony, but a lot of the high value added businesses in Japan in which we invest kind of exist behind the veil, if you like, and are not well understood, not well known by people because they don't see the brand name. But they're absolutely essential to the development of leading edge technologies and products that consumers touch and feel and use. Earlier, we talked about the core investing principles of the strategy, heavy focus on bottom up research, cash flows, valuations, and that stayed consistent over your time at Indus. But the strategy has also made some material adaptations. We talked about changing market structure in Japan from when you were first starting there to what it looks like today. I'm thinking of Q4 2018 after a tough performance period, made some material changes. Brian Lee joined the team as the chief risk officer. And a lot of those changes have led to some very profitable alpha generation years ensuing. Talk a little bit about how you preserve the first principles of the strategy, but adapt around the margins to continually improve year after year. Absolutely. This is a chastening job. It's a job that you will never master. There are always challenges. There are always opportunities. And overcoming the challenges and addressing the opportunities is a life work that will never be complete. I liken this job in a way to the game of golf. I think you can play 10,000 rounds of golf and still be hitting balls in the water hazard and in the bunkers and misreading putts. And you never, ever perfect that task, right? And I think investing is a little bit like that. And that to me is the fascination of it. That's what makes it so stimulating. It's always going to throw curveballs at you. It's always going to bring you down a peg or two. It never allows you to get too far overconfident or above your skis. So 2018 was an absolutely classic example of a very chastening period for us and for me personally. So you mentioned Brian Lee and what Brian has brought to Indus, I think, is an incredibly analytical data-driven approach that pushes information at the portfolio managers. So instead of the portfolio managers having to go and seek out that information or make requests, Brian is proactively providing a huge amount of data and analysis on risk and the interplay of risk with opportunity or how we define asymmetry, the upside downside of the opportunities as we see them. So for me, as kind of a a geek and someone who always wants to absorb and learn new things, it's been incredibly enlightening because it's helped me to understand much more intuitively, I think, because I, I now am so accustomed to looking at his data and his analysis, the interplay of risk management with the fundamental bottom-up approach that we use. So for me personally, the most 
enlightening aspect of that has been the sort of marriage of value at risk at the individual stock level with the subjective opportunities that we see, i.e. the the upside versus downside that we model. But marrying the subjective analysis that we do to the fact-based, backward-looking risk metrics on pairwise correlations or value at risk at the individual stock level has really helped me with the force ranking of ideas. So trying to be on the efficiency frontier of maximizing the expected return for every unit of risk that we're taking. And that's helped me manage size of individual positions, I think, differently. With the benefit of hindsight, looking back to Q4 of 18, we had too much concentration at the top of the portfolio. And in particular, we had too much value at risk concentration at the top of the portfolio. I think the S&P 500 was down 10% in December 18. It was one of the worst months for the S&P 500 in a very long time. And when the US sneezes, Japan can sometimes catch a cold. And that was, that was an example of that. So there were tremendous amounts of learning and, and retrospective analysis that we devoted to the fourth quarter of 2018. And I'm working very closely with Brian to this day still to apply those lessons So it's it's the marriage of portfolio construction and risk management with the underlying toolkit, which, to your point earlier, has stayed constant through time. We can still be fundamental investors and visit companies and have long-term investment horizons and be true to the original toolkit that's existed throughout the history of Indus, but marry that to a lot more data-driven risk management toolkits that help us to be on a different and hopefully better efficiency frontier than we were on before. And it's ultimately using information and analysis to improve our edge and improve our insights. The more information that you have, the more edge you're going to develop and the better you're going to do this job. And the pursuit of information is endless. So you need to be cognizant of that. You need to be cognizant of acquiring too much information and starting to get discombobulated by it or confused by it. So drawing the line when the marginal utility of an extra unit of information is no longer positive, I think is an important skill because you can get yourself very confused and you can drown in too much information. So drawing the line on what makes sense and what doesn't in terms of the analytics is is critical. But ultimately, more information, in my opinion, equals more edge if it's used appropriately. Zooming out a bit, what makes you excited about Japan today? There are so many things that make me excited about Japan today. I I could speak for hours about it. It's a market that still has a tremendous perception problem. And that, to me, is so much more of an opportunity than a threat. Because people misunderstand the place. They paint it with this brush that I think is so out of date and so poorly describes the current opportunity set. 30 years after the bursting of the bubble, people are still talking about public debt in Japan or deflation in Japan or poor corporate governance in Japan. And I think people tend to look at Japan through a very shallow prism that can paint it in sort of broad brush terms without really peeling off more layers of the onion and understanding what's happening beneath the surface. So I think Japan has a growing number of world-class companies that have world-class governance structures, world-class capital allocation decisions, but yet do not trade at world-class valuations. That, to me, is the disconnect in Japan. You have companies that have enormously deep and wide moats around them, that have a governance structure that absolutely is top decile on a global stage, that generate free cash flow relative to sales or relative to assets that's absolutely world-class on a global stage, but yet do not trade at multiples which come close to reflecting that level of excellence. There is tremendous mispricing in the Japanese market that stems from years of neglect and misunderstanding and focus, I think, on other places. Specifically, I think the US and China over the last six or seven years in, in an era of, of low rates and kind of growth at any price investing. So I think as people reassess the global landscape, Japan will get 
more attention. It certainly deserves more attention. It is a two-tier market. There are still companies which are not well-governed, which make bad capital allocation decisions, which have very low return on equity. I think it's an incredibly interesting opportunity set for long-short investing, actually. There's some great long opportunities. There's some great short opportunities in Japan. But broadly defined, it's under-analyzed, it's poorly understood, and there's not enough international capital which is seeking out opportunities in that market. So I'm very fired up about the opportunity, particularly, I think, after the last six or seven months when we've seen you know, another dislocation in markets. We've seen a lot of derating of many of these world-class companies. And I think that reflects a slowdown in global growth and the likelihood of a recession in the US. And at some level, I think it's justified. But I believe we're very deep into that derating process now. And we're a lot closer to the end of it than the beginning of it. And that increasingly, to me, makes the setup very, very interesting on so many vectors, on, in so many different end markets. But I think particularly in the globally exposed companies that are sensitive to economic growth in China and the US, and which are already discounting a pretty steep downturn. And I think in certain cases have definitely overshot on the downside relative to the three to five year opportunity they're going to see in their earnings and cash flows. And there's been a monumental improvement too in the corporate governance over the years. I know you have some great stories from many years ago meeting with management teams. Yeah, I mean, it is a two tier market still, and it's still possible to have disappointing meetings in Japan when you're almost speaking a different language about the cost of capital or about balance sheet structure. But no doubt, on average, the standard has risen tremendously particularly in the last 10 years, although it was certainly happening between 2000 and 2010 as well. But I think the advent of the Corporate Governance Code and the Stewardship Code in 2014 and 2015 really kick-started an additional improvement in governance and capital allocation. But yeah, in my early years at Indus, I was doing a visit with Sheldon. It probably would have been about 2004. I won't call out the company by name, but it was a small Japanese company that was headquartered in the suburbs of Tokyo. They made molded plastic containers. And some of them went into cartridge cases for toner and ink used in printers. And they also made big plastic boxes, storage boxes that you can store your clothes in or whatever. But this company had negative enterprise value. It had its net cash on the balance sheet exceeded its market cap. And we were having a meeting to talk about the valuation of the company, to talk about the fact that it may be a good idea for the company to use some cash on the balance sheet to buy back stock. We floated the notion that it would actually be really good for the management to buy out the company and do an MBO and they could make themselves very rich by doing that. They could, they could buy the company and pay themselves lots of money in the process. And we were meeting the president of the company and he just didn't grasp what we were talking about at all. It was like we were speaking a completely foreign language. I was doing the meeting in Japanese and he was getting increasingly frustrated by the line of questioning. And we were about 30 minutes into the meeting And he sort of snapped shut his folder that he was using to talk about what he wanted to discuss. And he said, nonsense. This is nonsense. Please leave. I'm not talking to you anymore. And the IR guy got up and opened the door and we were literally shown out of the building. He just stopped the meeting and kicked us out of the meeting. I think the chances of that happening today are essentially nil. You may agree to disagree with a company, and they may have a poor understanding of the cost of capital, but the chances of you actually being kicked out of a meeting by a president because the company has negative enterprise value and he doesn't want to talk about it, those days are probably behind us. And if you look at the vast majority of companies in which we invest, there's a huge improvement in their governance structures. They, at the very least, will have a third of independent directors on the board, quite often a majority of independent directors. The chair of the board may be independent. We call them self-help transformations. But there's so many big cap Japanese companies that have shed non-core assets that have focused their capital on higher margin businesses with higher asset turnover, much lower capital intensity, much higher levels of free cash flow generation. And they're returning more of this free cash flow back to investors in the form of dividends and buybacks. And people just haven't fully appreciated this change, I don't think. And this goes back many, many years. 
And you can find companies that are buying back 2 3% of their shares outstanding, paying out 50% of their net profit in the form of a dividend, just still trading on 10 times earnings and four and a half or five times EB to EBITDA. So there's a disconnect between the evolution of behavior among Japanese companies. And these aren't small companies. These are large, these are 50, 60, 70 billion dollar companies. And the valuations on which they trade, which don't reflect, in our opinion, the improvement in in governance and capital efficiency and free cash flow generation. So that to me is the essence of the opportunity in Japan. And I think it continues to be a very fertile hunting ground. So one of the characteristics I appreciate most about you, Howard, is we've had a lot of calls throughout the years. You never seem to get defensive about any question and you always approach things with a mindset of openness and genuine curiosity. I'd love to hear about how the Indus culture as a whole supports that and what things you guys prioritize from a total organizational level that enables all the employees to be that way. I thank you for making those comments, David. It's obviously very uplifting to hear you say that, and I very much appreciate that. My own view, and I think it's shared by the other portfolio managers without doubt at Indus, is that we're here because of you. We're doing this job because you've entrusted us with your capital to manage on your behalf. And as fiduciaries, we have a duty to maximize the return on that capital to the very best of our ability. I think you're very aware that we're going to make mistakes, but what we owe you is a commitment to learn from those mistakes and try to improve and build new techniques that avoid or at least minimize the risks of running into those same problems in the future. So as I mentioned earlier, this is a chastening business. It's a humbling business. It's a business that requires resilience and self-confidence and self-belief. You can't, you can't wilt under the pressure. You have to have the ability to come back and, and surmount new challenges and take on markets. You, know, you, you, can't, you can't invest without some degree of confidence. We're in the risk business and taking risk involves belief. But it's also a business that will knock you back and you're never going to be bigger than the market. You're going to be one small cog in a very, very large wheel. So there's always going to be opportunities to learn from what happens. And in my opinion, it's very important to be an open book about that with the people for whom we manage the capital. So that's my own guiding philosophy. On the broader question of Indus, I think we've obviously evolved a lot as a business over the last 20 years. We started as a long, short shop. We're now a majority long only shop, although we, we are still running you know, a lot of long short money and trying to grow that part of the business too. But in a way, we've had our own self-help transformation, I think through various iterations of our business and various changes of ownership and portfolio management. We became overly complex. We added on parts of the business that, again, with the benefit of hindsight, perhaps were a little misguided and were taking us in a direction that was distracting or adding unnecessary complexity to what we were trying to achieve. So we've, we've paired Indus back to a smaller number of strategies. We've worked very hard on our business development side. We're trying to project a much simpler version of ourselves with a group of products that's smaller than we had before, but which should be more coherent in terms of an offering, easy to understand. And we've reduced the headcount at Indus. We're a leaner business than we were five or six years ago with a much simpler lineup of products. And I think that's brought a unity of mission, a unity of purpose to the firm. It's brought some new adhesive, I think, to the group. It's easier to know people better if there's fewer people you're you're dealing with within the firm broadly. We're a small partnership. The partnership speaks regularly. We're very open with each other about where we think we can improve. I think there's no dominant character at Indus who has some overriding control over the business or manages it in his or her vision. We have a, we have a sense of common purpose, but we're also allowed to express ourselves very freely and very openly and to challenge each other. I think we're an incredibly open book when it comes to being able to challenge each other, to speak to each other. We're actually working with an outside group at the moment called the Conscious Leadership Group, which I think has added to our sense of unity and purpose and opened up more doors in terms of being open with each other and 
and being constructively critical of each other and challenging each other to be better versions of ourselves and not having any qualms about doing that. So we've gone through a tremendous change. You know, the original founders and owners of the business have now retired. The people who ran the funds originally are, are no longer running money for Indus. So we've gone through a complete ownership change, a complete change of fund management. So if you like, you could call this Indus version 2.0. We'd love to close out on some fun questions. First one, would love to know what you do to decompress from your workday. I know we've had conversations about Squid Game over dinner, so at least I know I know one thing. But other than that, I think the one thing that really stayed with me, you know, growing up in this village of two thousand people, was the great outdoors. As a kid, I was never indoors. I never sat indoors in front of a computer or in front of the TV. I lived outdoors, whether it was kicking a football or chasing my sister or you know, whatever it was. So I love to be outdoors and I love the natural world. And one of my other passions in life is trying to reverse some of the damage that the human race has done to the natural environment. So I'm an avid ornithologist. I love watching birds and moving to San Francisco has been wonderful in that respect because it's an incredibly rich environment for bird life. There's seabirds, there's raptors, there's songbirds. And I'm lucky enough to live in a part of the city that's sort of on the edge of some open space. So I love getting outdoors with a pair of binoculars or, you know, a camera with a telephoto lens to observe the natural world. What are your favorite books? I'm more of a non-fiction reader than I am a, a fiction reader. I'm very interested in history and archaeology. So I love learning about ancient Egypt. I love learning about the history of Europe and migration patterns through the Middle East and the Caucasus area of Russia, or how Europe was populated. So anthropology is, is something that I find very, very interesting as well. I'm one of those people that likes to know a little bit about a lot of things. <laughs> The history of the motor car is something I find extremely interesting. When I was at ING Bearings, I was the automotive analyst. So the history of Ferrari or the history of Porsche or the history of Lamborghini, I find those topics fascinating. So I love to read about that. I wish I had more time to read fiction, to be honest. My life, unfortunately, doesn't really involve a lot of downtime to read fiction. I tend to absorb information through nonfiction sources, and it's often about history. Which person that you don't know personally has been most influential to your thinking and your philosophies? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, there's so many, honestly. I'll be honest, I don't think there's any one investor who has had a tremendous impact on me. I think I've learned my trade largely through the people at Indus who've influenced me, you know, Byron Gill, Sheldon Kasowitz. Those have been my mentors as investors. I mean, I was obviously familiar with the work of Benjamin Graham and how he influenced Warren Buffett. And I've read a lot about Peter Lynch at Fidelity. But I can't say, honestly, that they've had an enormous influence on the way that I think about investing as a craft. I think that's been developed through my time in Japan and my understanding of the Japanese language and my 20 years at Indus Capital and observing and learning from those who came before me at Indus. In terms of people who... You know, the people who inspire me outside this realm and this industry, I think are always people who try to maximize their ability and who come from humble backgrounds or people who weren't necessarily born with a lot of natural talent, who've had to work extremely hard to get to those places and have worked passionately and relentlessly to achieve their goals. I'm always inspired by people like that. Well, Howard, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you. This afternoon, thank you for all the work and partnership that you do on behalf of you, Tim Co. It's really been an honor. Well, likewise, David. It's been such a pleasure speaking to you. And we're honored and privileged to be your partner on this quest. I hope you enjoyed this conversation and maybe even piqued your interest to explore further. See you next time.